Shumrabyug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sure Look, Sure Listen, the podcast that takes a pop at culture. Sure Look, Sure Listen. 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 Uh, very good. Sure, listen, Benjamin, I think you've made a slight error there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to It's Haley's World, Ireland's leading Haley Steinfeld fan cast. This <laughs> week in Haley's World, we'll be taking a look at Haley Steinfeld's new Spider-Man film, <laughs> Spider-Man. We're going back to the Spider-Verse. Watch out, there's so many Spider-Men. Then we're also taking a look at Haley's new TV show, Hawkeye, where Haley Steinfeld stars in episode three of Marvel's Hawkeye, probably the best episode so far. Yeah, it was very, very good, Michael. Very, very good. Uh, if that wasn't enough, Michael, yeah. we've decided, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you and I... Oh, no, I've forgotten exactly. the main conceit, Michael. Should yeah, listen, yeah. Michael, if that wasn't <laughs> enough. Very good. Benjamin, every podcast is someone's first podcast. I wouldn't worry about it too much. No one should will listen, notice. Michael. Should listen, Michael, if that wasn't enough... We are also going to be taking a look at Korean cinema and television and how mm. it comments on the society in which it takes part. Um, yes. It's very, 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 very interesting stuff, Michael. We're, we're transitioning to a Mark Kermode style film review podcast and we'll, oh. make, uh, we'll make well-informed decisions and articulate commentary on film. On very film. good. We won't be calling them movies anymore, Michael, from now on. They will be film. Does Mark Kermode say film? No, he doesn't. I'm just, you know, just in general trying to scrub up the image of the You're podcast. You're trying to scrub up our image a little bit, Ben. Speaking yeah. of scrubbing up our image, we've seen from Brazilian Comic Con, Benjamin, we've yeah. seen the new trailer for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse 2, Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, which in my opinion is a bit of a mouthful, and I tried to get it wrong and accidentally got it right. <laughs> That's hilarious, because I was there going, oh, he's doing one of his famous Mick Elon Gates things bits. No, um, I wasn't. But, well, I was trying to, but it just worked out that that is actually what it's called. Yeah, very good. That, you've actually nailed it. Yeah. Benjamin. Yes. It stars our favourite actress, my favourite actress, and yours, Hayley Steinfeld, as Gwen Spider. Spider Gwen. No, Spider what's she Gwen. now? She's Ghost Spider Gwen. Spider. No, she's Spider Gwen, isn't she? She's is Spider Gwen. Oh, She's Ghost Spider in the in the comics. Oh, is she? Okay. Mm. I suppose walking around with your name on your superhero name is probably not the best move. Yes, if you were Spider-Man, you'd be called Spider-Ben. Yes, and I, then I suppose I would get beat up a lot. Yes, Michael, people I would, would be, be like, revealing part of my identity. <laughs> people would say, is that Spider-Man? And they would say, no, no man is he. It's Spider-Ben. <laughs> that was <laughs> unusually cruel. Benjamin. <laughs> okay. I, d I didn't know this was coming this soon. I didn't know this was. I didn't know this was coming at all. My God. Oh, classic. classic. Um, but I, in general, it. Yeah, yes. I mean, it was so popular, Michael. It's hard to believe that it, it wouldn't have gotten a sequel. Do you know what I mean? It was so big. Of course, it got a sequel. Of course, it got a sequel. Ben, it's from the directors of the Lego Movie. Of course, it got a sequel. Oh no. Yes, the Lego Movie too, Ben, was not great. No, it was a terrible film, Michael. So hopefully, into the Spider Verse, across the Spider Verse. It's not Peter Parker, but it's other guys who are Spider Men. Two yeah. Electric Boogaloo will be slightly yes. better as a sequel from the lads from Lego. It's Miles Morales, Ben. It's uh, yes. Spider Gwen, played by our favorite Haley Steinfeld, and it looks like it's Spider Man twenty ninety nine with your favorite actor and mine, Oscar Isaac. Oh, Oscar Isaac! I love Oscar Isaac. He's in everything, Ben. He's the only competitor in the world to Haley Steinfeld's dominance. Yeah. So we had a toss up when we started this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, whether we were going to call it, um, whether yes. we were going to call it Stanfelds. Um, which are uh, <laughs> Haley Steinfeld stands, or if we were going to call it, um, I don't yeah, go have on. An Oscar Isaac one. <laughs> very disappointing, Ben. That was a very strong setup and a very weak finish, I have to say. Haley Steinfeld, welcome to Haley Steinfeld, the Ireland's leading Haley Steinfeld podcast. Benjamin, <laughs> yeah. do you think Haley, Haley Steinfeld is doing so well because of her famous dad, Jerry Seinfeld? Is it? It's not. Get out of town. You know they're not the same person. <laughs> I think I think they are. Um, I think they're related. Benjamin. Yes. Do you think the animation style that they use in the future scenes, the twenty nine? Tell us first of all who's Oscar Isaac playing? Who's Spider Man twenty nine? Qu twenty nine. Uh, uh, Oscar Isaac quickly, is playing. Quickly, Benjamin. Um, <laughs> Oscar Isaac is playing Spider Man twenty ninety nine. Who is Miguel O'Hara, and he is mm. the Spider Man of the future. Yes, um, the distant future of twenty ninety nine. And Michael, as you can tell from his name, Miguel O'Hara, he's a he's an ultra modern kind of multicultural man, um, mm. and he used to work for Oscorp, Michael. 
um, in the continuity of the comics and he worked for Oscorp as a scientist but he had a moral uh, qualm with what they were doing Michael because Oscorp as you know as you know no good no good no even good in the future in even the future, in the future po- potentially even less good Still a bunch of bad eggs. So in that particular case, Michael, he takes he takes umbrage with the entire affair and becomes uh, Spider-Man 2099, uh, based on the heroic tales of a once legendary Spider-Man. Oh, I see. It's mm. interesting that he is very diverse, Ben. He's, uh, yes. he's a little bit Irish and a little bit um, Hispanic of some denomination, I'm not sure which. But he's not from the current crop of diverse characters. He's from the 90s when there weren't that many. He's from an old crop of diverse characters. Yeah, yeah. That at one point, we're quite impre- we're quite new. Yeah, yeah. In the nineties, yeah. I believe it's very progressive. Benjamin. Yes. Do you think the sketchy art style of the twenty ninety nine future is what they're going to go with, or is that um, because the trailer's not finished? I I think we're going to see multiverse hop and Michael. Um, yes, I think that I is, think, that does appear to be the point. I think different universes will get different art styles. Oh, I think is what we're going to see. Um, I think this movie, interestingly enough, is probably just as important to comic book fans as it is to, or, sorry, just as important to like visual artists as it is yes. to comic book fans. Um, right. One of the key draws of the first Into the Spider-Verse was the animation style and how it pushed the boundaries of what we do with a single style and you know that movie is now cited across the world in animation courses as a, an example of what you can do when you're really pushing you know when you're outside the envelope uh, yes when you're way outside the envelope michael when you're um, thinking outside the box very good very good um you can join us on our uh, graphic design thinking podcast and innovation podcast pushing the envelope um, oh, yeah. okay that's not bad that's not a bad name that's in your top three so far yeah doing pretty well Stan Feld. Um, yeah yeah, where we interview people who are mildly connected to the Spider-Verse movies. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, I think in terms of that, they probably have to push themselves very hard uh, to come up with a, a worthwhile visual sequel, if that makes sense in any form. Yes, because if you just did the same style again, you've missed the point a bit, haven't you? You have, yeah. You've, 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 uh, you've dropped the ball, Michael. I mean, it'd still be good yeah. if they had the same visual style. It'd still be good. But they have to push some envelopes or else it's just going to be a retread. Yeah, otherwise you just end up at a post office, Michael. you got to push envelopes, you know. you got to do it. Yes. Would you like to see something without multiverses? Um, yeah. Uh, it, it's only starting. It's only starting and I'm already starting to get a bit nervous that everything is multiverses now. I have a fascinatingly depressing theory, Michael. Would you like oh. to hear it? Yes. Yeah. So I think the rise in multiverse narratives, because they are everywhere at the moment, Michael. Um... Spider-Man in into the thing. multiverse. Uh, Spider-Man into the multiverse. Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, anything to do with Marvel lately. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what if also um, the Flash movie looks like it's going to be multiverses. Yeah. So I, I think... Graham they, Norton and Henry Cavill were both on... No, oh, sorry. Tom Holland and Henry Cavill were both on Graham Norton the other day. Yeah. I mean, Graham Norton's show is a multiverse chat show. So that's really interesting when you get like different sense. Henry Cavills from different universes. Um, yeah. So, uh, one of the things, that Michael, that I think is happening there is because our current um, situation on this planet is a bit, shall we say, anxiety-inducing. Right. You know, climate change. Yes. Coronavirus. The coronavirus, yes. Okay. Uh, things like that. And Americans. Because, um, Americans, I mean. The existence seriously. of... Yeah. What a threat. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the incoming water wars, the classics, Michael, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, mm. many people are connecting with multiverse narratives because it offers some kind of glimmer of hope. You could just that, fuck off to another universe. You know, once we fuck this one entirely, because <laughs> mm. that's what's going to happen, Michael, we can just sidestep... <laughs> into a brand new clean, much more diverse <laughs> multiverse dimension. so I, I i'm fascinated by the current rise in multiverse theories um and i think michael it's it's already as you said despite only starting reaching saturation point um and possibly michael that's why i found episode three of hawkeye so bloody oh, refreshing very clever and very good um you've skipped over a, a, a highly steinfeld based segue but that's fine 
Because oh, all on, what's, your, what's yours? Go on. Give me oh, I didn't have one, Ben. You know, I freestyled these. I freestyled okay. them. They're off the cuff. But um, just like Hayley, Hayley Steinfeld's fighting style in Hawkeye, I just come up with it on the fly. Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was easily the best episode of this show, first of all. Yes. Very strong. And possibly my favourite episode of this new Marvel TV situation in total. M- Michael, I sat on the couch with my good lady friend. Yes. And at the end of episode three of Hawk Guy, what a Hawkeye. what a guy! Um, mm-hmm. I said, I turned around and said, "This is the best one of all of the TV series so far. This is this is the best thing they've put out from the new TV wave." Yes, I it's think I so agree good. with you, Benjamin, and that feels bad to me. It's I would say it's it's like a it's nearly as good as a PG version of the best of Daredevil and Jessica Jones. Yes, yes, that is exactly correct, but with a sense of humor. It's yeah. It's a PG version. It's a little. It's a soft and gentle. It's not. It's not Hawkeye. It's not Matt Fraction's Hawkeye with nudity and killing and breaking legs and. Yeah, we've done that, Michael. We've done that. We, we can't have that. You can't have that. It's on Disney, Ben. It's on Disney Plus. And it's got Haley Steinfeld in it. But it's yeah. It's good. It's actually good. It's, it's um, very good. The car chase was the car chase was one of the highlights of the Marvel TV universe so far. A joy to watch, Michael. They were doing a car chase, Ben, and it was nearly from the comics, but not quite. Do you know one of my favourite things about that, Michael, and spoilers for episode three of Hawkeye, so if you haven't watched it yet, look away Get now. But one of the one of the <laughs> one of the things that I thought I would hate, if you had explained it to me without me seeing it, I would have gone, That's bullshit. But the Pim arrow is fucking great. <laughs> the big arrow, Ben. The big he's arrow's a, great. He's got a big huge arrow. It's great. Benjamin. What a moment. Yeah. My my feeling is that arrow is too big. That arrow's too big. Was, that too went big. through the bridge. <laughs> it probably would have taken down that bridge. Yeah. And where did it go? It just did disappeared. It, it's temporary pin particles for this one, Michael. Oh, was it? Okay, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thank you for your, for the, your for the... in-depth knowledge of Marvel science. Benjamin. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the strengths of this episode was that it focused on the whole point of it, which is the the relationship between the Hawkeyes. The Hawk guys, yeah. Yeah, the um, two Hawk guys. So... It, it's it's really interesting um, to see they, they've laid it out so well, Michael. And I detest the fact that I now like Jeremy Renner. Renner. Mm. Um, I heard you su- you subscribed to his app. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and he took all my money, Michael, and I got nothing out of it. All I can do is get a little message from Jeremy Renner every day. Um, what does he say? He's he's just like, hi, I'm Hawkeye, and that's it. That's all he says every day. <laughs> that's it. He's got nothing interesting to that's say. That's all he says. And then every once in a while, every six months, he releases a very strange soft rock uh, music video oh, of good. him walking in a desert. It's very strange. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what you want. And I'm only making one of those things up, Michael, and to find out, you'll have to subscribe to the Jeremy Renner <laughs> <laughs> Don't though, because don't. Uh, I think it's gone. It's gone. All joking aside, I think it. it's gone. I think the Jeremy at Renner app is gone. Hey, do you know what? Theoretically, Michael, it was a precursor to OnlyFans. <laughs> like Jeremy I don't think Renner. It was, I don't think it was a precursor though. I think it was at the same time. He just. I don't know. The, the Jeremy Renner app was slightly ahead of OnlyFans because I he looked got, it up. <laughs> he got sucked into some sort of multi-level marketing thing, and someone sold Jeremy Renner on this, and they were thinking, "We'll get Renner first, and then the dominoes will fall." And then the rest of the Avengers. We'll get Renner. We'll get Steinfeld. We'll get Johansson. And no, no, didn't it, did, it didn't work at all. Um, he did have a huge fan base, though. Like lots of Renner. people signed Renner, up to that. It, he doesn't have a huge fan base, Ben. It's Renner. Ben, stop speaking about <laughs> Renner. Let's talk about the show. Benjamin, what do you think of? What do you think of bloody what's her name? Do you know high kick? Maya. Echo. Echo. Maya. Yeah. She's not called Echo yet, is she? She's not called Echo yet. Um. So she's a character from the comics, Michael, and we've seen her a few times. Um, she's not always a villain. Uh, she's not usually as... a villain, I would say. She's not really a villain in this either, though. We haven't really figured out if she's a very bad villain or if she's just someone with a, a big old axe to grind, Michael. Mm. Um, she does seem to lead a bit of a mafia, though. Um, she does, yeah. I mean, th- no doubt, tracksuit mafia, not a great bunch of lads. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben, the comics, they're called the tracksuit Draculas. Is that what they're called? Yeah. Is that a, dro- a joke or, about their accents, Michael? Yes, I believe it is, and it's probably, probably why it's not in. Probably wouldn't, yeah, probably wouldn't get away with that so much yeah. today. Uh, yeah, also they might be planning to introduce Dracula at some stage. <laughs> yeah, and then that'd ruin it. Disney Plus is Dracula. Yeah, or yeah, Michael Morbius is Dracula. Benjamin. Yeah. Does she have any superpowers? 
No, yeah. not by the looks of things. I think she's... Mm. I think, because this is such a grounded series, Michael, I don't think we're too interested in metahumans just yet. But what about I, Big Arrow? Uh, Big Arrow is... is <clears throat> Big Arrow is, uh, you know... Big arrows and everything, Michael. Um, <laughs> <laughs> polluting rivers, um, yeah. building excessively sized uh, targets. You know, uh, oh, yeah. big arrows. What's ruining this country, Michael? Very good. I see. It's like big pharma. Ben, yeah. <laughs> um, in the comics, she's kind of like Taskmaster. Um, I think she's kind of like Taskmaster in this, Michael. I think mm. that's the point. I think, but it's not any particular. A power set that makes her, that gives her that ability to mimic other people. It's pure observation. She's learned to adapt. Um, She's to learned to watch styles. people and yeah. echo them in a, in a sense. I always feel like echoes watching me because she is very good. She, she is. Yeah, she's watching you to learn your moves. Benjamin. Yeah. I don't like in grounded shows where they have little little tiny women beating up fully grown muscular superheroes. Yes, I still that, I, 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 I still you know can't I get behind it. I, was I still can't there. get behind it. I was sitting there, Michael. Yeah, and I said to myself, "Yeah, I'll what piss me. yourself. That'll piss me off." <laughs> I I'm totally fine with it. Totally fine with super powered women beating up normal men. Totally fine. In yeah. fact, sometimes sometimes you can find that on specialist websites. I've heard, oh, but. God. <laughs> but <laughs> but Benjamin yeah. I don't I, I just can't get behind normal women beating up big giant Russian men y- yeah uh, look, I just can't few, get behind it there's a few moments there where you're just going like the the big big Russian guy mm. you know the, the main big he's a big man he's he a massive a, unit Ben he's a big big man Um. And I think it's really, really interesting. I, it's funny that you said, as as your segue, Michael, that Haley Steinfeld's uh, fighting style is kind of made up on the spot. It, she's not as yes, believable in the role of a, a superhero, but there's a lot of cuts for her moves. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. They're they're covering a lot of um, they're they're covering a lot of Haley Steinfeld's work with quick cuts. I don't know if this is Haley Steinfeld's first action film. I don't think it is. Wasn't she in that one where she was a teenage spy with Samuel L. Jackson? Oh, yes. Um, Samuel L. Jackson does mini Avengers. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I'm a teenage spy, I think it was called. Um, yeah, probably. I think she was in that. So she has some action experience, but she seems to be... Having said that, though, Ben, we said this last week, but they've really diverged her from the comics where she's super competent yeah. and really quite smug. Yeah, she's not that at all in this. Um, no. I think they've done a, a really, really good job of showing, and I, I think it's that same thing from last week that I said, where her lack of experience is emphasized so heavily. Um, there's that phenomenal scene where uh, Echo, or Maya, as she's known in this, uh, chokes her, mm. and uh, it ca- it gives her a serious shock. She's really taken aback. And she's like, how has that lady choked down. me? Yeah, as uh, as you would, because oh, up until... <laughs> yeah. Oh, that lady choked me. Clint, did you see what you did? <laughs> um, but then as well as, well as yeah. that, Ben, her joy playing with the trick arrows, even though, like, she killed a shitload of people. And, she you know, did. She definitely she killed did. A load of people got killed there. But it, the joy of seeing the different trick arrows was very well played, I felt. I enjoyed the fact that Hawkeye has trick arrows and was caught out. He was just like, oh... <laughs> Yeah, oh, you got trick arrows, like, okay. We're, we're out of normal arrows, and she's just like, what, what? <laughs> trick yeah, arrows? I, th- I thought, Benjamin, that his, um, that his thingamajiggies, his, um, his shafts, as it were, screwed into the arrowheads, so it didn't really matter what type of arrows they were, but that seems to have changed now. Yeah, no, now he's got trick arrows. Michael, they just saw he... this is a massive opportunity to expand on Hawkeye, didn't they? Do like... trick arrows. Let's do <laughs> yeah. some trick arrows. Let's do big arrow. I think that's one of my favorite things, though, is, you know, Marvel Phase 1, you know, took those heroes and tried to make them believable. believable. You know what I mean? And now, because it's so successful, so successful, they can just go, no, do you know what? I'm going to give them purple suits and trick arrows, and I'm going to reference my own universe, because I'm going to give Hawkeye a USB arrow that was used in What If... 
Very good. And Avengers, Ben. That was the thing that really pissed people off about Avengers. That oh, really? <laughs> Haw- Hawkeye's biggest contribution was a USB arrow. <laughs> and they just keep bringing it back. They keep bringing it back now that his USB arrow is useful. When she shot the Russian guy with the USB arrow, that was brilliant. Yeah, it was class. And yeah. I, I think, you know, as a series, this is... It's so clean compared to the other three. Mm, it, go on. It, it just... I don't know if it's the simplicity of the story they're trying to tell. Yes. I don't know if it's the chemistry between Jeremy Renner and Haley Steinfeld. I yes, don't I don't know what's causing it, but it's a joy to watch. There's no slog, there's no there's no moments where you go, okay, yeah, cuz you you watch you watch personally for me, you watched Loki once or twice. Yes. And every once in a while there'd be a scene where you'd go Ooh. Meh. Oh, really? Meh. Okay. And there'd be a scene where you go, ooh, sometimes, ooh. absolutely. Um, and then the big arrow. Times, it, you know, it, <laughs> big arrow. Um, but in this, it just works really well. It just moves really well, and you're invested. And I don't know, it's just very well done, Michael. Unfortunately, Benjamin, for Marvel, Marvel Disney Plus, and Haley Steinfeld fans, or Haley Stans, as we call them, um, not their most successful, their least successful so far. Ah, oh, feck. Yeah, yeah, about half the viewership of Loki. Oh. But it makes sense, because Loki's a lot more popular than Hawkeye. Yeah, they don't have that Hiddleston rabid fan base chomping exactly, at the bit. Exactly, so mm. I'm seeing a lot more ads for this along the lines of the best is yet to come, and watch out, here comes some surprises. Okay, well, that, that'll be that'll be fun, yeah, Michael. Yeah. We'll look forward to that. Um, one of the nice moments for me, Michael, is where right at the end of the episode, and major spoilers, bloody yeah, Jack sticks Hawkeye's own sword up against his throat. And I was like, what? Oh, he won't like that. He won't like it. He'll probably yeah. have a big fight with him. I don't think he will have a big fight with him because no. we've seen a scene. We've seen a scene where they're sitting down at the dinner table. Yeah, I, so I think... Jack... I think that's going to be brushed off as a misunderstanding. I think Jack will probably go into full cover his ass mode and pretend to be the foppish fiance. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then but eventually we... Sword? See, I don't know if they're going to work it as a, a secondary subplot, Michael. I don't know. It, we, I'm assuming... Well, I'm not going to assume anything because we don't actually know, Michael, but it's heavily hinted at from Kate's point of view that Jack is the murderer of Armand. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But we don't know that had, yet. Remember, she had the Werther's original. Yes, I know, but we don't mm, we don't know that yet, Michael. We don't know that yet. But uh, assumedly, she's going to work to get him to justice. Benjamin. Yes. I think. Go on. That. Yeah, no, I don't know. Do you think the Hawkeye really killed her uh, Maya's dad? I see. This is the interesting question, right? And I think it's the the moral stumbling block for the entire show. Mm. Because one way or the other, Michael, Hawkeye did kill all those people. He killed a shitload of people, Ben. Even if he didn't kill Maya's dad, he certainly bloody would have. He, yeah. It, if he didn't, it was an oversight on Ronan's yeah. part. <laughs> not a moral choice. He so if him. someone else killed him, he's not going to be able to get all high and mighty about it that someone stole his suit and, and killed Maya's dad. Because he definitely would have. Yeah. He just, you know, facts are facts. That's... Yeah. He's going to stabbing people with swords. Benjamin. Yeah. Did you spot some of the Easter eggs about who is uncle? I, see, I missed them now, Michael. Now, I didn't see them. So go on, lay, lay them out there for me and I'll you take a some, guess at who it might be. Do you want some... It's pretty fucking easy, Ben. Oh, okay. It's pretty damn easy. Okay. Do you want the first, do you want the first and the easiest one? Go on. Well, Benjamin, do, there's big spoilers coming now. Okay. I hope you're braced. Brace yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to strap myself in. Hang on. Okay, strap I'm yourself in, Ben. Did you see the name of the mechanic where her dad worked? Oh, no. Benjamin, it was Fat Man Auto Repair. Oh, it's the Fat Man. <clears throat> Benjamin. Yeah. Did you see when Uncle uh, when Uncle squeezed, squeezed, squeezed Maya's cheek? Yes. And did you notice that the laugh was one of one Vinny D? Was it Vinny D's laugh? It's, it's one Vinny D, Ben. Not Vincent Diesel. 
No, not not that Vinny D. Not that Vinny D. The other Vinny D. Vinny T. Vincent, D- Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah, Michael, I cannot believe that they are finally introducing Hammerhead into the Marvel Universe. That's amazing. <laughs> Very clever, Ben. Of course, you're doing a joke. Everybody knows it's King Ping. It's King going Ping. to be King Ping. Marvel's King Ping. But it's early days King Ping. Go on. I mean, because the the tracksuit mafia, Michael, isn't that big. It's expanding aggressively, and as Hawkeye points out, he will do anything to expand the 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 operation. You know. So, yes, but he's. I think I think it's going to be the case where it's just one of his many fingers in one of his many pies. Okay, it's an old pie finger situation. Yeah, it's a pie finger situation because he's quite heavy. It's you know, it's a bit of fat shaming in my opinion, but we won't get into it. I mean, they always do it quite well with Vinny D'Onofrio. He's never portrayed as fat. He's just portrayed as kind of a mountain of muscle and aggression. There have been some fan images, Ben, showing the the King Ping from Marvel's Daredevil, but bulked up Ooh, to nice. make him a little bit more comic accurate. And that's what the rumours say, Ben, that they're going to bulk him up with a combination of a fat suit and a bit of CGI. Oh, I see. I see. And I suppose well, it makes sense. It's been five, six years, seven years since we saw him. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, I do, is, is it is it going to be the kingpin that we've always had, or is it just going to be? Oh, look what we did! Look, oh, it's Ralph Boner. <laughs> oh, look. No, yeah, is it going to be Ralph Boner again? I hope it's Ralph Boner personally, Ben. I hope it's the king. It's the kingpin, Ralph Boner. Um, we just have to wait and see, Michael. I suppose. You see, I don't know, Michael. It's it's getting very complicated. In the we'll we'll have to wait until two weeks from now when we see uh, No Way Home. Spider Man No Way No Way Home. There's a lot of these companies pushing a multiverse narrative, Michael, and Venom seems everyone's, to think he's going to be part of the Marvel Universe soon, and Morbius seems to think yeah, everyone's yeah. a multiverse. Everyone's, everyone's a multiverse. Everyone's a multiverse all the time, Ben. I, I've probably done this joke before, but the person, the people I really feel sorry for is everyone, everyone who had to sit down with their mam at Christmas and say, <laughs> no, mam, that's a different Spider-Man. That was a different series of films. <laughs> and now they're all back together. <laughs> and I know I'm going to have to have that conversation with my mother when The Flash comes out on television in three years and say, no, y- y- no it was a different Batman, but they're all they're all together now. I remember that Batman. I saw that Batman in the cinema. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like, it's I didn't like, know he was Michael still Keaton. doing it. He's, he's not. He's, he's not. Still I thought doing he was it. in Spider Man now. He's also in Spider Man. <laughs> Also and Spider-Man. Morbius, yeah, and yeah, Morbius, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they're in the same universe. And they're all comic book movies, aren't they? Because Batman and Spider Man, they fight together a lot, don't they? Fuck it. At this stage, Ben, you might as well. That's all I'm saying. And, you and, might as well get have, them all in there. We all have a little meltdown and go, "No, Mum, oh. no, oh, you never <laughs> listened to me. I wanted the PlayStation Five because <laughs> we're terrible people, Michael, at our core. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And that's what. And we I'm do. forty, Ben, and, and and I, my mother doesn't buy me playstations. No, it says a lot about our society, Michael, doesn't it? It says a lot about it's... our society. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, Benjamin. I nearly slipped there on that buttery segue that you set us up. I nearly fell on my bum. My bum key moon. <laughs> what a segue. Benjamin, do you want to lead us in there? Speaking of things that say a lot about our society, Michael, have you seen Korean cinema and television lately? My God, what a lot to say. Benjamin, you can't go anywhere for seeing Korean cinema and television these days. They're winning the Oscars, Ben. Yeah. They're the number one rated show on Netflix. Yep. Then they're the next number one rated show on Netflix. And then after that, shortly after that, they're the next number one rated show on Netflix, Ben. And they'll probably be the next. (laughs) Probably be the next number one rated show on Netflix. It's a it's a hell of a time to be alive in the Korean media world. It I really is. It really is. Benjamin. Yeah. Benjamin. Yes. We we talked a few years ago about the the influx of Korean pop culture into um into the western consciousness. Yes. And I think we did that based on a couple of new shows. Um Snowpiercer was one yes. of them. We talked about um, Train to Busan. We did. Did we just talk about Korean things on trains? Is that I, what, I it, was I that it was, her topic? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was just all about trains. And Korean, Korean people, was... people, people, Korean people going on trains. Benjamin. We talked about Train to Busan. We talked about Gwemul. We talked about Snowpiercer. And little did we know, as prophetic as it was, um, we were really only seeing the preamble. 
to Korean omnipresence in Western popular culture? It was just a little taste, Michael. Just a little it was taste. just a little, oh, little taste at Benjamin, because as you said, we've had since then, we've been absolutely inundated with Korean prestige drama. Yes, we have. We're drowning in prestige. Benjamin, we've had Parasite. Very we've good. had won an Oscar. Squid. It won an Oscar. We've had Squid Game, the the twenty twenty one phenomenon on Netflix. We've won had the hearts BTS. Of the nation. Won the hearts of every nation, Ben. We've had BTS. We've had a Black Pink. I think they're K-pop bands, Ben. I certainly I, wouldn't. I couldn't tell you. I wouldn't. It wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't be my. Uh, uh, very good. Very good muttering, Benjamin. Mm, and we've had. <laughs> And we've had, just this week, Ben, or possibly last week, <laughs> yeah. we've had the latest world-dominating Netflix Netflix success. We've had Hellbound. Yes, Michael, Hellbound. What a disturbing show. Benjamin. Yes. One of the maddest things I've ever seen on television. I think I've had that nightmare, Michael. Go on. Where a bunch of things are chasing me, and if they catch me, it's not going to be very good. Hmm. It's mostly me, though. Going, Ben, you're late for the podcast. I'm coming after you. Podcast stress dreams are a weekly part of my life. It's right, true. Benjamin, why don't you tell us about um, the series Hellbound by Yun Sang Ho? Why don't you yeah. give us a little, a, 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 just a short summary. Not not over, the, let's not go over the top here. A short oh, summary. All right. And let's avoid plot spoilers for the moment. Okay. In a world. Yes. Very similar to our own. Yes. You better not be naughty. Yes. Or they'll come and get you. Oh no. And drag you to hell. Mm. In this Korea, you don't want to be on the naughty list this Christmas. It's not a Christmas show, so, I mean, I appreciate no. the comedy. I appreciate the comedy you've done there, but yes. it is quite misleading. Benjamin, Fair this, is, <laughs> this is a horror drama Hints of black comedy, but only the slightest oh, the, little sprinkling. The slightest little sprinklings. The slightest little sprinkling of black comedy, yeah. and it's about it's about Korea in the modern day, Ben. Yeah, but there seems to be some sort of cult leader. Yes, uh, and Chairman Jung, if you will. Chairman Jung, he seems like a bit of a bad egg. And what's mm. going on in Korea in this day and age, Ben, is people seem to be getting prophecies from from an angel of God. Yes, and in the prophecy, they get a. Uh, they get a time. They're told when they're going to die. Terrible stuff. And they're bound for hell, Ben. All of them. Now, my first thought upon seeing this was this was a very strange interpretation of the story of Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> and that what happens is the image of Oliver Cromwell appears to people and he says, to hell or to Connacht? <laughs> and this story follows the people who choose not to go to Connacht. I'd watch that. Were. <laughs> we could do, we could do a classical Irish reimagining of the same plot. We Benjamin. might have to. <laughs> yeah. And then, it, so the great mystery of it is: is it true or not? Like, is this real? Is it really happening, or is this a big hoax? And I tell you what, it is true. Yes, it is true. Three big smoky venomy boys come and get you. Uh, it's like Ronan the Accuser and Venom had a baby, and it's as disturbing as it sounds. And they they just come and get you. I think it's a very strong performance in that role by Haley Steinfeld, um, almost unrecognisable <laughs> under the makeup and CG. Michael, I'm not even being funny, but we also talked about Arcane last week on this podcast, and Haley yeah, Steinfeld yeah, yeah. is one of the main voices for it. Yeah, yeah, Benjamin, it's, there's no there's no media other than <laughs> Haley Steinfeld. Um, Haley yeah. Steinfeld is the only media left. There's actually a really great um, behind the scenes video on YouTube at the moment, Michael, of her getting into character. Um, for the, for the three venomy smoky venomy boys. Yeah, and she just goes and hangs around Gold's gym and kind of yeah. soaks in the testosterone, and uh, goes from there. Benjamin. Yeah. So, you get a proclamation from the the angel of the Lord Oliver Cromwell, and you get told <laughs> you're going to die in a certain amount of time. Yes. And then the three venomy boys who look every inch like like a like a a, a, a first draft drawing of venom. They yes. show up. And they beat you up very publicly, and then they burn you to a crisp. Yes, you get a public spanking, Michael, and then... You get uh, absolutely fucking annihilated in And then public. barbecued, yeah. And then barbecued, absolutely fully roasted by three CGI Haley Steinfelds. Very and hard to watch every time it happens. Very unpleasant. Very unpleasant mm. altogether. 
Can I start, Ben, with a weakness of this show? Go on. Please. Yes. I think that the opening scene whereupon we see someone in a cafe mm-hmm. and he's the latest victim of the three Haley Steinfelds. He is. He, and we see him worrying that his time is about to arrive. Yes. We see the three Venomy monsters arriving, absolutely kicking the shit out of him. Not good. And then turning him into a barbecue. Yes. And that moment is simultaneously one of the biggest strengths of the show but also one of its biggest weaknesses. Okay, go on. Because when I was watching it, I said to myself, because Ben, we watched this on the recommendation of Nine Wassies up on the Discord. Up on that Discord, baby. You should get up there and yourselves, said, ladies and gentlemen. He said to us, get up on that Discord and watch that Hellbound. It's even better than Squid Game. It's from the director of Train to Busan, which you both liked. And I said, oh, I did, did like that. I will, I will give that a watch. It was social yeah. commentary in movie form. And Benjamin, what, what, I, what I liked about it was... After I watched that opening scene, I said, well, that was a hell of a thing. Boom. And it certainly gripped me. Yes. And it and it certainly made me think, Woo, what are we getting in for here? Is this some sort of mad... Where is this going to go? Yes. Uh, look at them. They're lepping around the place. They're smoky venoms. They're turning their hands into spikes. And... There's all kinds but, of things happening. But then, Ben. Yes. It's quite calm after that. Yeah, there's not a very whole long time. time. It's too, for a too very, big, too very big long a start. time. Too big a it's start. It's a massive start. And a lot of the following plot revolves around, is this true or not? Yep, speculation, and, Michael. Hearsay. And exactly. Is it speculation? Is it CG? Is it people messing and jessing? But Benjamin, we've yes. seen it. We've already seen it. Live and first hand. We've seen it happen. Oh, okay. Have we? Well, it oh, happens in the opening mean, scene. You mean, oh, I'm sorry, Michael. You mean in the television series. I thought you meant as a real life event. I was like, is that happening? Is this a thing? No, of course <laughs> it's not happening in real life, Benjamin. You absolutely lunatic. I was very confused there for a second. Um, yeah, we've seen it, Michael. Um, but yeah, you're right. It does completely undermine the premise of, oh, could there actually be big smoky venom Haley Steinfeld's beat up lads in the street? Um, but we know because we saw it. We're like, yes, there is. Because I tell you what, Ben, I watched this with my good lady friend and she yes. missed the first 15 minutes. Ah. And after she missed the first 15 minutes, she was absolutely fucking gripped. Yeah. Because she was like, what's going on? Are, is something going to happen? And I was like, I don't know. But I did know, Ben. I knew it was going to be big <laughs> smoky <laughs> venoms. Because you saw the first 15 minutes. <laughs> Because I saw the first 15 minutes and I, the whole time I was watching her going, I wish I was having that experience. I suppose they need to design the show that way to get people invested. They want the, oh, this is fucking mental reaction yeah. from yeah, yeah, yeah. the internet, I suppose. Yeah, and from the viewers, because I don't know if I would have stuck it out if yeah. if it was this slow-burning, philosophical... The Quiet Korean drama. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I see the necessity of doing the Big Smoky Monsters right up top, but yes. also feel it was a weakness. But also it kept me invested, so... I'm I'm really torn on it. Yeah, it's hmm. There's a whole lot going you know, I'm on. Like, I'm like Haley Steinfeld's character in Pitch Perfect Three. I don't know whether I want to st- continue with my studies or become a singer. I mean, the, the choices are endless for Haley Steinfeld. She really is this generation's non-stop. most talented actress. Um, Very nonstop. And I'm Hayley sure Steinfeld. she's. I'm sure she's found herself in that position many times. Do I want to go down the more academic route or will I continue to be the global sensation that is Hayley Steinfeld? Those two lads in Ireland have a great podcast about me. I can't let them down. (laughs) Benjamin. Yeah. Right. That's the plot jigger pokery out of the way. Right. But the reason that we're really talking about this is because I tell you what. Mm -hmm. The old Korean TV. Yeah. It might be just a case of we're getting the cream of the crop that is rising to the top. Yes. And then we're getting to see it. Nice it little lap there. Well done. Thank you very much. It might be it might be that we're getting that. We're seeing the best of the best because mm-hmm. Korea, you know, the rest is being filtered out for us and not making it to us. Mm-hmm. Um, but I tell you what, Korean cinema and media is definitely much more about stuff than the usual stuff we're we're getting. In the sense that it deals with some pretty heavy topics. It's about things. Yes. My whole the whole time I was watching this I was thinking this is about things. Yes it is. 
It's not just a series of events happening that someone said, won't this be cool or won't that be cool? No, no, there's a big commentary underneath all that, Michael. <laughs> on on everything. This of is everything. about stuff. It's, it's about all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a little police skewering. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of religion skewering. Mm. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, it's funny, I think, and I could be saying this completely out of turn, but it seems that a lot of Korean, um, Korean cinema and stuff is very, very critical of Korean society mm. as a whole. I, I, we rarely see anything from Parasite to Train to Busan to, you know, take your pick of Korean things. It's, they're not, they don't go easy on Korean society. No. It's definitely about stuff. Yeah. Um, so in in terms of this week's topic, this one is definitely, I think the the most pointed kind of critique is aimed at religion. Um, yes. And how religion is insidious, I suppose, once it actually gains power. Well. Am I, am I, the, would I be? I mean, that's, it's cert- that's certainly an aspect to it. That I mean, so spoiler, we're going to have to get into spoilers. We for, are. For we're going to have to. now get on um, in there for one thing it's it's split down the middle it's the classic korean thing of the first three episodes are and the second three episodes are practically different shows yes. it's kind of like season one and season two they're almost like two sets of mini series rather than one straight story i saw a really good analogy of um before christ and after christ for naming mm. the the two sides yeah, of yeah, the, yeah. the season of the of the season that's a good one um and the first part is definitely about, or one of the me- multitude of things that it's about, mm-hmm. is the fear of, um, the fear of religions or cults, whichever one you want to go with, yeah, using, using natural disasters or using current events to gain footholds. Yeah. So manip, or uh, I suppose, exploiting genuine tragedies for their gain yes yeah. and i mean is it ben is it because of coronavirus is this a reaction to coronavirus i don't know when this was written but mm. if you remember benjamin in south korea south korea was one of the very first countries to get a coronavirus outbreak back yes. in back in the beginning of 2020 yes and one of the one of the major things that happened was it were there were christian churches who were anti-maskers Yes, I remember this. They had a huge state. I remember seeing that video, Michael. There was a huge stadium full of people that refused to wear masks and loads of them mm. got sick. Yes. And it definitely put Christianity and a kind of sheep-like following of of religious doctrine. It definitely put that aspect of religiosity in Korea onto not just the national stage in Korea, Mm. But the global stage, for the first time ever, I, I'd say the oh, the vast majority of Western people couldn't tell you how prevalent Christianity was in Korea before that. I, if you asked, if we did a Vox Pop, one of your famous Ben's Vox Pops, if we uh, went yes, out in the street, yeah. and, and you went around and you rushed up to people and you surprised them, you said, quick, what religion are they in Korea? Like Billy on the street. Yes. But, you, you know, with hard-hitting social issues. And you said, <laughs> what religion so are they in worse. Korea? Just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just make people cry. <laughs> Be very good. I don't think a lot of people would have been saying Christian or Catholics or Protestants. Yeah. I think you would but have gotten the the classic guesses of, you know, Buddhism or uh, Buddhist, a generally Hindus. A generally broad and inaccurate response. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it definitely put Christianity and even more so Christian Christian type cult behavior. On the global map as a feature of Korea. Yeah. The only reason I had any idea about Korean religion, Michael, and this is a terrible example and serves to show it is because of Kim's Convenience. Go on. Um, Kim's Convenience is a television show that Michael and myself have watched. Um, first three seasons are very good. Fourth season, meh. Um, I would argue in retrospect, Ben, only the first season is actually good. Oh. And then it begins the decline. But anyway, go on. Doesn't anyway, that we'll here come back there. to it. But uh, religion plays a huge part of the life of uh, the two main characters, Mr. Kim and Mrs. Kim. Um, and oh, they're always at church. Yeah. Um, mm. They're always at church. And it's very important. And there's a huge Korean... Um, delegation, I suppose, in that local church community. Um, yes, and I think it's I, a Korean church. 
I went and looked it up after um, that, and it turns out that that's very widespread. That's a very common thing in the United States and in Korea. Yes, yes, indeed, Ben. Soul at night is. If you look around, there are neon Christian crosses everywhere these days. That's it's bad. one of the few. It's one of the few countries I think where Christianity is growing. That's doubly mad. Yeah, yeah. It's so. I mean, th- this is the the religiousness, but also the cultiness of of Chairman Jung. Yeah. I mean, he, Chairman Jung is your classic creepy cult leader. He's a big old cult leader, Michael. It's it's very obvious. <laughs> yeah, you do, you don't want to be around that fellow. He's a bit he's a bit dodgy. He's got a whole bunch of dodge going on, Michael. Um, but it's only when we, we find out exactly why he's so dodgy, you know, as as we go through. And the the big secret is revealed in episode three. Um, go on. You know, and it turns out that uh, he he was probably the first man to, to be given an L prophecy of his death. You got 20 years, pal. Make he him did, count. He absolutely. He got 20 years. He was found a cult and become an absolute shithead. Become, yeah, become an absolute shithead um like the the wrong response to being told you have 20 years left to live yeah there are a couple of moments which foreshadow it which i really enjoyed like the fact that he was rescuing people by going into burning buildings and disarming lunatics with knives because he knew it wasn't his time oh yeah because he could yeah because he knew he knew he wasn't going to die then I, yeah. I like those moments that was good this is, this is, yeah i suppose if you did have foreknowledge of it you'd be like this is fine Mm. I, I I can do this. I've got all the time. Yeah. Go on. The other, the other thing that kind of shows up a lot, Ben, in recent, in these recent Korean dramas that we're watching a lot of, is mm. um, faceless masked VIPs. Is is this a reference to? Um, hang on, what's his name? Lee Don Wok. Who's that? He's the streamer. In no, 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 not no, no, not that guy. I mean the the so when they stream the the demonstration as they call it of um of the three venoms coming to get the lady. Oh yeah, yeah. And one of the one of the things they really make a big song and dance about is everybody wait make way now because here come the rich faceless VIPs wearing oh, masks yeah. who are presumably behind funding all of this. Yeah, and I mean yeah. That's an interesting parallel, because first of all, I think they were. I think many of them, it were, if not all, were foreign. Okay. Um, because they were some of the only people where you could see a slightly different skin tone. There weren't any other foreign people in this at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a very interesting parallel to Squid Game, which yes. we watched a few weeks ago, where it turns out the Squid Game is funded by gross masked foreign vips who enjoy watching misery who enjoy watching misery and inflicting it upon people is this some sort of reflection on korea's fear of outside influence of foreign direct investment so to speak michael i mean we live in ireland ben we we are a product of foreign direct we investment. live in a society ben and we know what foreign Anonymous investment often leads to in this country, especially rampant, unregulated foreign direct investment. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I don't know if you're talking about housing crisis or religiosity, but in both, the housing <laughs> crisis thing is kind of unique to Ireland. I, well, not unique to Ireland, but but it's, it's certainly very, a, it's, it's very a bit more Irish. Serious. Yeah, but there is certainly in Ireland some foreign wealthy mask wearing anonymous VIP investment oh. in using religion to influence irish culture 100 percent, michael um we have the we won't say any names but we have a particular political party that is heavily funded um by evangelicals in the united states for example mm, um, yeah and they are very much a, a an anti-mask pro-life you know it, it, very extreme religious ideals um funded party here in ireland and it's oh, it's an interesting one isn't it so we have seen that we do have a direct parallel for that here we do have a direct parallel here for that but also it, it is interesting that in in a lot of the recent korean stuff this concept of masked vips keeps mm. keeps popping up you can't turn your head for something horrible happening because of masked vips well i suppose it probably speaks to a, a similar religiously funded kind of expansion i guess if you if you want to look at it that way most like th- those churches in korea must be coming from somewhere 
I, well, I, I'm not, I don't think it's necessarily religion because sure, religion and religiosity and cult behavior is a massive part of the story okay. of Hellbound. But yes. religion, to my mind, had nothing to do with Squid Game. Yeah, but it had everything to do with death and classism and things like yeah, that. I, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of it is classism, which I'm sure yeah. you're going to get into with Parasite in a num, minute. Num, 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 num. But also the thing to remember about Korea is that Korea, Japan, that part of the world were very isolated and are relatively recent kind of joiners of the world community. Yes, Relatively recent joiners Relatively. of the world community. They were they were a kind of isolationist societies, and Korea in particular seems to be. I don't know how long it's been. Ben, I, I probably could have looked this up a bit better, but I would say it's really Korea has only been part of the world stage for a hundred years, and it's really going through a massive cultural shift of yeah, big time becoming. Not just part of the world, not just letting, not just letting foreign culture and media into Korea, but also now exporting it. Mm. But I think classism is the secret people with money, the secret people behind the scenes is definitely a bit of a recurring fear. It, it is. It, it's it's like the, it's the big fear. It's it's. <laughs> I mean, Squid Games and Parasite, Michael. They're not as anonymous. Squid um, Game. It, sorry, Squid Game. Um, and Parasite, Michael, are definitely the two ones that deal closest with classes segregation and, you know, economic disparity and desperation and, and things like that. They do it in very different ways. Go on. Absolutely. Um, I mean, Squid Games is, is a... Or sorry, Squid, Squid Game. Game, sorry, is yeah. a slightly exaggerated what-if scenario. You know, what if you were really desperate for money and what if, you know, it, it's a little bit like um, Running Man with <laughs> with higher stakes do you know what i mean as as entertainment for rich people and it's a little less feasible than what happens in parasite um in parasite we get a family drama on on mm. two levels uh, one being the upper class and the, the other being the the working class on the poverty line um class and we get an interplay there but one of the interesting things about the marketing for parasite um michael is that in the marketing for parasite all the posters have the eyes of the characters completely blanked out um, right they use uh you know the sensor blocks the little black sensor bars yeah um over the eyes of all the different characters um to hide their facial features and it's really interesting again um because it's it's that anonymous threat of um something or other so it's a really interesting parallel i'd like to know I, I wish i had more information on you know how much international interference is currently going on in korea but it's clearly an issue for the artists where they're like oh <laughs> yeah they're like oh there's a lot of foreign investment in this is making me a bit on edge i'll tell you what's another recurring theme ben even if it's not a main theme um but i'm seeing a lot more fear of loan sharks and addiction to gambling in yeah. the last couple of... Now that Korean stuff is on all the time. The idea of loan sharks showing up and beating you up seems to be... It seems to be kind of gone from Western media. You only see it now in in historical things or gangster things from the 50s mm. or... You know, but it seems to be ever present in, in Korean drama as something that could conceivably happen. I think that's an interesting one, isn't it? Like... There was a time in Ireland, Michael, where that would have been par for the course. Yeah. You know, a loan shark would have been the person that gave you money when the bank would simply outright refuse you. And I don't know if that's an economic transition, as in because Ireland has gone through so much regulation and foreign direct investment as a result of the Celtic Tiger, do we now exist in a society that makes money more accessible and therefore loan sharks are no longer necessary? We live in a society, Ben. Is we live in saying? a society, Michael. And I don't know enough about Korea's financial situation to understand whether or not that is the case for Korea. I don't know if they've reached a level of financial stability that allows them to eliminate the necessity of loan sharks for people living on the poverty line. Now, arguably, yes, because films like Squid Game exist, hmm. we could surmise that is not yes. the case and that loan sharks are, in fact, incredibly prevalent. Um, <laughs> I don't know, because if that were the case... And you, you just based 
your opinion on a country or an opinion on a, a, a civilization based only on its media production, you would think that there was one woman in America and it was just the actress Haley Steinfeld. No, that's true. Oh, that is true. Okay. No, that's, that's actually on the Benjamin. money. Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. Come here. It's, it, this is very unusual where you're, you're, I'm the one bringing up themes. Yes. But <laughs> I'm quite enjoying I, it. It's um, a nice switch. The massive... <laughs> The massive driving theme of both Squid Game and Blood Bloodbound or Blood Bloodshot Blood There's so much blood everywhere. Hell to pay is yes. Hell to pay with Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yeah. Um Hell's back. Back in hell, baby. <laughs> ben one hell of the too. major things <laughs> is the the absolute fear of shame. Yes. Yes. Shame 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 shame. Yes. The avoidance of shame is such a massive theme in both of these shows. So in in Hellbound, especially the second part, yes. it becomes a whole thing where there's a, a special organization sh- set up by the, the sexy kick-ass lawyer lady from part one. Yes. And she helps people hide their proclamations and to die off camera. So as not to be stigmatized. Um, so it's not really for them to be stigmatized; it's for their family to be stigmatized, yeah. and their friends, and their their place of work, and and it's a massive driving factor of the of the second part of that show. I think that's what makes it so interesting. We get like a little glimpse of that uh, when we meet, uh, and I'm going to get her name definitely wrong, but it's Park. It's the it's the yeah, woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can call her Park who that's receives her proclamation, and her children are targeted. As a result of yeah. her proclamation, um, and that's that's the first grain that we see of oh, this is going to cause some issues. <laughs> yeah, this is very unpleasant. Um, and it's such an interesting thing that that woman tries to help the families of those who are proclaimed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, and it's it's just a really fascinating thread to follow. It's just like she also becomes she also becomes a kick-ass lady. She does. She's the, doing high kicks. She does. <laughs> she's got she's got a she's got a real she's got a real fighter, Michael. Her and Haley Steinfeld should kicks. make a movie she's got together. A big, a big metal stick and she's whacking people with a big metal stick. It's fantastic. She's having a great time. Um very good. But you're right that 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 obsession with reputation and avoiding shame seems to be again one other big driver in a lot of korean film and cinema um yeah i mean if you look at squid game half the characters are in squid game because they're they've got some sort of secret hidden shame yeah and it's 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 a real driver isn't it because they they, that's the that's the that's how they get you by the the short and curlies michael is they have they know your shame or they mm. they have some secret to your thing and it's it's a it's a such a limiting character trait for them because they can't progress because their shame has to be meant or their secret shame has to be kept under wraps it's it's a really interesting kind of driving force and we see it repeat over and over again it's in some japanese um television as well it was in that one alice in borderland um oh i saw that the other day i didn't actually yeah, watch it but I, um, I saw it it's mental um alice in borderland is all about um basically there's there's a world of a game and it's tokyo but it's not tokyo because it's only got the people who have been transported inside the game in it as opposed to the 20 million 30 million other people that live in tokyo and um, mm. i think it's even more than that i think i'm being very conservative in my estimate there but anyway they get transported to this world but basically who they were before they were in the game is either a huge source of shame or um something that they don't want to pay attention to so they kind of create new selves in the in the game world and that's that theme is even more compounded in another very recent netflix korean drama which was sweet home benjamin you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble by talking about a japanese drama on an episode about korean drama yeah no it's fine i'm going back to i'm going back to korean stuff now you're going um, back to korea now okay good good yeah there was another one earlier this year michael called sweet home i don't know if you saw that at all about that the, was with um, that was with uh, Reese Witherspoon. Yes, uh, Sweet Home Alabama, which is a very racist film, Michael. We should definitely do an exhumed episode on Sweet Home Alabama, and just all we can do, we should live stream it, Michael. And what we can do is we can sit <laughs> there, and every time something very, very bad happens, very, very racist, yeah. we can just go. Ugh. 
<laughs> um, and that's what we'll do but anyway Sweet Home Michael um, is very similar to how Hellbound was made Hellbound is based on a webtoon yes um, and so was Sweet Home it was based on a very successful Korean webtoon right and in that webtoon Michael um, it's it's very interesting in Sweet Home it's set in an apartment block um, and there is a monster virus Oh. That has infected the world. So what's happening is um, people are becoming infected and turning into monsters. But the monster that you become is a reflection of your inner shame or obsession. Um, oh, no. So, for example, uh, one of the characters is a bit of a peeping tongue, Michael. Um, oh, no. He likes uh, to sneak a secret around. looking Thomas. But he gets turned into a giant eyeball. That oh, just gross. A, a giant floating eyeball that leers through the windows of people and eats them. Um, so, you know, that kind of idea. But that's all based on secret shame. And you literally manifest your shame in your monstrous form. Um, there's another oh, no. one. There's another bodybuilder who takes steroids. Um, but doesn't he purports to be a natural bodybuilder. It's the whole thing. And he turns into a massive hulking brute of a creature. Like oh, a gross. really disgusting Hulk. But it's all to do with shame manifesting on the outside of your body. And it's a really fascinating look at it. Um, it's, it's like if, if it infected you, you would turn into a hundred foot monster made up of thousands of Haley Steinfelds. Thousands. Thousands and thousands. <laughs> Just falling off you. <laughs> Just Haley Steinfelds falling off you as you <laughs> shamble around Tokyo. Um, this one is Korean, Michael. It's Korean. Um, Very good, you've caught me. I've made um, an intentional error, Ben, to see if you'd notice. Yeah, it's Korean, Michael. But yeah, that secret shame thing is, is a whole thing. So that's another part of society that's really, really looked on. Um, again, I suppose Parasite has crystallized all these things in that it, the, the working class family has nothing to be ashamed of, and yet they are made to feel that shame constantly. They hide who they are, um, they lie about who they are as people to get ahead. Um, and it, it's all about disguising what they once were um, to be better mm. suited. And they, they, you know, have you seen Parasite, Michael? I don't... Benjamin, as we discussed before, I have seen Parasite on a screen while I was doing something else. And I feel I didn't give it my fair attention. Fair. Okay. In Parasite, it's very, very simple. There's a rich family and a poor family. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not connected at all at the beginning of the film. But basically, um, a young man needs a bit of cash, so he pretends to be a tutor for the rich family's daughter. Someone who farts loudly. Uh, yes, a tutor. Um, right. Classic medieval role of someone who would taste the food, and if they farted, the food was good and the king could eat. And if they didn't mm -hmm. fart, the food was bad and the chef would be flogged in a public square. Um, ah, the king's tutor. The royal tutor. Um, so, in this particular case, Michael, it's a tutor, T-U-T-O-R. Um, who oh, teaches people educational okay. things. Um, so he's taken right. on as a maths tutor. Um, he replaces his friend who's going off to university. And so he finds oh. this job quite by happenstance. But this young man has no qualifications, Michael. Oh. And therefore... So that never stopped you. I mean, anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> You're some fucker. Um, <laughs> I am not qualified to do that podcast. This podcast is true. <laughs> um, so uh, he then... Um, takes on the role, forges documents, and hides who he is um, to take mm. part. And then over the course of the film, he finds other jobs for his family in this household because it's good money and the people are fairly clueless. So his father becomes their driver, his mother becomes their chef, um, his sister becomes their art tutor. Um, and all of them are lying. His mother's not a chef, oh. his father is... He can drive, but is not a professional driver. Um, and it's about the tension that builds um, for the poor family as they realize how bad the rich family are or how snobby and arrogant they are as people. Um, and they can't reveal who they are because they're purporting to be middle class people with qualifications and things like that, while the rich people are just being incredibly classist towards poor people mm. and calling them animals and disgusting. And th this poorer family has to kind of bite their tongue as they go through the film because they can't actually defend themselves. Because then they'll give themselves up. They give themselves up. It's a fascinating film. 
Um, and it's done much better, obviously, than my little description. But again, Michael, central to that is shame. Shame. Everything's about shame. And class. Um, yeah, it's a big and thing. And class. Oh, yeah. Michael, what an episode Should- we've had today. Should look at Ben. That got all very heavy, didn't it? Uh, it's Benjamin. Been a heavy episode, Michael. I talked about foreign direct investment and evangelical I know, funding. Very, very strange, Benjamin. I have to say though, back to Hellbound for a second. Okay. Um, very effective horror. Oh, some of the most effective horror. Not the thingies, really. Not no, the three of enemy what boys. What they do. What the people do to each other. Yeah, what they is do is often Michael. worse than what the what the enemy boys do. And I'll tell you what, I've never, we won't do spoilers for the ending, but I've never been so worried that a baby was going to be dismembered on television before. No, no spoilers for the ending, was that? Was that I'm just... not going to spoil the ending, <laughs> but I've never before in my entire adult life sat there going, are they going to dismember this baby on live television? Because if it went any way like it did for all the other people who got dismembered, oh. ooh-wee, that's going to be mentally scarring. <laughs> I'm not going to do any spoilers, but bloody hell, some real traumatic stuff. Oh, uh, no good. No I hope good. you don't have any favourite characters. Because <laughs> I tell you what, they're bloody hellbound. Oof. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oof. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, what yes. did you think? What did you think of Hellbound? What do you think of Korean media in general? You can get in touch with us and let us know in a couple of different ways. You can find us on the oh. interwebs at www.shomrabeog.com S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com It means tiny room in Irish. You can find us on Instagram at Sherlock sure Listen Podcast. means Sherlock sure Listen in English. It does indeed. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Listenshire. Look, I'm not going to say it again. It's clear what it means. All right, you just let me believe that there was, you know, some kind of structure to the universe and then took it away from me. <laughs> um, and then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all of those pale in comparison to the wonderful world of Discord. Get up on that Discord, baby. Hop up on it. You can get in touch with us. You can give us recommendations. You'll get a name drop on the podcast. Ooh wee. Um, oh, you what too, a rare treat. You too could be a nine wassies and you too could have your topic chatted about on this very podcast. But you have to let oh, us know. Oh, what a treat. What a rare treat. What a rare treat. Ladies and gentlemen, you can join us in a week's time where we are in the, fully in the middle of Spider-Man fever. And we're going to be doing a retrospective on the Spider-Man films that have come before. Oh, no, I'm not watching the Garfield ones. You have I've, to. I haven't got time for that. You have oh, to. No. Because I, 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 I dibs Raimi ones. I'm, they're all mine. I, no, I already know his origin story. But you got to watch it again, Michael. And again and again oh, and again. Oh, no. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join us next week to watch more origin stories. Bye-bye. All right, bye, everybody. Watch out the Spider-Man.